Good morning, Rutherford County. It's a, a great honor and a blessing for me and Katrina to be back with you this morning to share with you uh, another wonderful message, encouraging message um, about how great how great our God is. We've been on uh, several programs here uh, in the last several months uh, about testimonies where God has shown His self mighty on our behalf and our family's behalf. I shared my testimony. Um, about my physical um, situation on a previous radio program. And then we shared previously about what our daughter went through. And today, uh, as we were preparing for this program and getting before God and seeking Him on what God wanted us to share with you, I really had it in my heart, and so did Katrina, to uh, share with you how powerful the Word of God is and the, and the message that He gives you, whether it's from the written Word the Bible, a uh, spoken word from a minister or a, a friend, a true friend in your life, uh, or just a, a revealed word that God gives you uh, um, when you're praying, an answer to prayer, or you feel uh, His voice come to you as you're seeking Him through whatever your, your circumstance may be. And through every everything that we went through um, before, you know, we've been married for 18 years, and there have been countless examples in our life where God has shown himself mighty on our behalf, like I said before. And um, today I really wanted to focus on how we made it through each one of those situations, regardless of the circumstances, what God did for us by having his revealed word in our hearts and standing on that word and not wavering, not looking at the circumstances, what was going on around us, but trusting in our God and knowing who our God was through each, each battle. And every time he brought us through something, it strengthened our faith and our trust in him, knowing that when, when the devil brings the next battle, God's going to be right there. It, you know, David said in, in the book of Psalms, he's never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed have to beg for bread. And we've seen that in our life. You know, we financially we've gone through battles and struggles, but through everything, God has shown himself faithful and he has been there through everything. Absolutely everything. And it's just it's I hope that you're gonna be encouraged today and just open your heart and and listen. And if you get one thing from today's message, you can trust God with your life and you can trust in his word. And he will help you through any circumstance, adversity in your life. And I wanted to start with, a. there are several examples in the Word, but one of the greatest examples that's used in the Bible is the children of Israel. And throughout the scriptures, God says, don't be like the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness and they came out of ex exile. Um, they were in slavery. Uh, just to give you a brief history, they were in slavery in Egypt for about 400 years, I think it was, and God heard their cries. They cried out to God for him to save them, um, to deliver them from the slavery, because it was bad. They, they had it bad. When you read through the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, it talks about their, predominantly in the book of Exodus, it talks about their exile, and they, they it was really bad. Um, for sake of time, I'm not going to go through everything they went through, but what I want to focus on is the promise. Before the children of Israel went into exile, God gave Abraham a promise. Abraham was the father of Israel, the children of Israel. Um, a nation was born from his offspring, Isaac. And uh, some of you may have um, heard the reference Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were the, the founding fathers of the nation of Israel and the Israelites. And um, in Exodus chapter 6, um, I was looking for where God gave the initial promise, but this is when God was answering the cries of the Israelites, and he raised up Moses and Aaron to go before Pharaoh and plead for Pharaoh to let God's people go. And God gave Moses uh, a word to give the Israelites, and if, um, I'm going to start in uh, verse 4. This is Exodus chapter 6, verse 4. It says, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan. 
the land in which they lived as strangers, temporary residents, foreigners. And I have also heard the groaning of the sons of Israel, whom the Egyptians have enslaved. And I have faithfully remembered my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will free you from their bondage. I will redeem and rescue you with an outstretched, vigorous, powerful arm, and with great acts of judgment against Egypt. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who redeemed you and brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And this is the promise that he gave to Abraham. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. You have the promise of my changeless omnipotence and faithfulness. And Moses walked in that word and went before Pharaoh. And through a series of events, Pharaoh let the children of Israel go to worship their God. And the children of Israel were led out of Egypt. Uh, they came, there were several circumstances in their life that they were going to need their God to show up big for them. They were on their way out of Egypt. Pharaoh changed his mind, sent the army after them. So this nation of people are stuck between an army of Egyptians who were sent to bring them back to Egypt for slavery and the Red Sea in front of them. What were they going to do? Now they had the word. The promise was given to them. I will be your God. You will be my people. And I will bring you into the land that I promised to give to Abraham. That word did not change because of the circumstances they were faced with. And the children of Israel immediately started complaining, murmuring. We should have stayed in Egypt. Why are we here? Now we're going to die. Where are we going to go? And God told Moses to raise his hands and God split the Red Sea so that the children of Israel could walk over on dry ground. That is a, a massive miracle of the mighty power of God to split an ocean where you have water on both sides and the ground that you're walking on is dry. That's been underwater just moments before. So the entire people, children of Israel, walk over on dry ground, get across. And then as the Egyptians are also trying to cross on that dry ground, Moses let down his hands and the water consumed the entire army of the Egyptians and they passed away. And now the Israelites witnessed this. They saw it. They knew their God. But yet on the other side of the water, after they worshipped praised God, rejoiced in what he had done. Days later, moments later, hours later, they start complaining again. We need something to drink. We're now in the desert. We have nothing to drink. We have nothing to eat. Again, God showed himself mightily to the children of Israel, provided them water from a rock, gave them food that rained down from heaven, because God was true to his promise. He was proving himself to the children of Israel, just trust me. I will lead you to the promise. Now they're in the desert. It's twelve. I think history shows us it was a twelve-day journey to get from where they were to the promised land. So in twelve days they make it to the promised land. They went through many trials, many grumblings, many complainings, and if you remember, I ref I told you bef just moments before that God tells us in the Word. Do not be like the children of Israel who murmured and complained in the wilderness after seeing God's mighty hand. So he, he takes them to the promised land and it's now time for that promise to come to fruition. God wants to give them the land. And um, I'm going to read another scripture in Numbers um, where God tells Moses, pick 12 spies, one from each tribe of Israel. I want to send them into the land. I want you to spy out the land. Look and see what's there. Moses gives them the instruction. He tells them how to do it, what he's looking for. Get some of the fruit, bring it back. 
God literally, this, this promise was literally for the children of Israel, heaven on earth. I'm going to give you heaven on earth. This is the best of the best. God had nothing but the best for them. But all they had to do was trust in him and trust in that promise to see it come to pass. And they had all these miracles that God had done for them in the wilderness. God delivered them from an army in the wilderness. They went through battles. God showed himself faithful despite their grumblings and complainings, their circumstances. God was always there. And so in Numbers chapter 13, um, Moses sends out the spies. They go into the land. They, they come back and they report to Moses what they saw. They show him the fruit. They give him the report. Yes, the land is absolutely wonderful. But in, okay, so in verse 27, they reported to Moses, we went into the land where you sent us. It certainly does flow with milk and honey. And this is the fruit. The cluster of grapes required two grown men to carry back to the children of Israel. That was just a cluster of grapes. Grapes that we purchased from the grocery store. It took two grown men to carry these grapes. They had never seen a land like this before. And God wanted it for them. But the... Spies give Moses a report and say, but, yes, it's a great land, but the people who live in the land are strong and the cities are fortified. They're walled, very large. Moreover, we saw them, we saw there the descendants of Anak, people of great stature and courage. So they're telling Moses, there's no way, no way we can do this. These people are too big, cities are fortified, we can't stand against them. So they're giving a bad report to the children of Israel. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once, take possession of it, for we will certainly conquer it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people of Canaan, for they are too strong for us. So they gave the Israelites a bad report about the land which they had spied out, saying the land through which we went in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people there we saw in it are men of great stature. Then the children of Israel, after hearing the report, immediately start weeping, complaining. They're not praying to God. They're grumbling, complaining, groaning out. They murmured, now we're going to die in this wilderness. We're going to come to this land. We're either going to die in Canaan, the promised land, or we're going to die in the wilderness. They got so bad they even wanted to raise up new leaders to lead them. But Caleb and Joshua, doesn't mention Joshua here, but I'm going to share with you where Joshua, down here in chapter 14, him and Caleb rent their clothes and wept and cried out to God. Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jeff, Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes as a sign of grief. They knew the promise and they believed in God and they knew God was able to deliver that land into their hands and they wanted to see their God work mighty in their behalf. But because of the evil report that those ten spies brought to the people of Israel, the children of Israel spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness and God said, I will take Joshua and Caleb into the promised land. But because you chose the ten spies, you chose to give a bad report and not trust in me and lead the people astray. You nor the people of Israel will see the promised land, but your children will be raised up and they will be the ones that will conquer the land and I will give it to them because God was going to be true to his promise. God is true to his word. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. It doesn't matter what the children of Israel saw in the land, what they went through in the wilderness. God's word was true. And all they had to do was stand on that word. And that is, that is what God has done in our life. He gave us a word. He told us to stand on it. Trust me. Prove me by it. I will show myself mighty on your behalf. And that's what God's done for us. And Katrina is going to share with you something else we went through that we didn't share on the last radio program we were on. But it, it just proves what I'm saying God's word is true. Doesn't matter what the circumstances are. God 
will be true. He cannot lie. The Bible says he is not man. He is God, and he cannot lie. He will be faithful. And I want to start um, one thing that as we were studying this, and even you know what God has brought us through, one thing that God really started showing me is how the devil brings fear, just like he did to the children of Israel. He brought fear to them. They were afraid because they didn't think that they could conquer the land. And out of that place, they took their eyes off of Jesus. So I want to start. I'm sure everybody, you know, most people are familiar with the account where Jesus walked on the water. So I want to start there. Um, I'm going to read it in um, actually two different accounts of it. But in Matthew 14, starting in verse 22, it says, Now right before this happened is when Jesus fed the 5,000 with, I think it was five loaves of bread and two fish. 5,000 people were fed with five loaves of bread and just two small fish. That was a major, major miracle, just like when the Red Sea parted and the Israelites went across. So the disciples were there. They witnessed this. They saw this among many, many, many miracles that Jesus had done. So right after that, it said, Then he directed the disciples to get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent away the crowds. So he told them, you're going to go to the other side. Okay, that was the word of the Lord for them. And after he had dismissed the multitudes, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was still there alone. But the boat was by this time out on the sea, many furlongs. A furlong is one-eighth of a mile distant from the land. And it was being beaten and tossed by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch, about three o'clock in the morning, three to six a.m. of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the water. Okay, so Jesus had told them, you're going to go to the other side. And then Jesus came to them walking on the water. And immediately when the disciples saw Jesus, they knew Jesus. They'd been with Jesus. They spent every day and night with Jesus. But they did not recognize that it was Jesus walking on the water. They were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they screamed out with fright. But instantly, he spoke to them saying, take courage, I am. Stop being afraid. So then Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, and I stopped there, he still did not recognize, I mean, he said, if it is you, Jesus had just told him, it is I, don't be afraid. And he still said, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he told Peter to come. So Peter got out of the boat. And he walked on the water. And I, I can't even imagine walking on the water. He was walking on the water with Jesus. That is a miracle that none of us have ever experienced. Um, so he started walking toward Jesus. But then when he perceived and felt the strong wind, he was frightened. And as he began to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me from death. And instantly Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and held him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Because at every point you could see how that devil came and brought that spirit of fear to him and it caused him to doubt. He didn't even recognize Jesus, the son of God, who had done all these miracles. So when Jesus got into the boat, the wind ceased. So if you read that same account in the book of Mark, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but it talks about, you know, the whole thing, just like it said in Matthew. But in verse 51, it's Mark 6, verse 51 it said, and he went up into the boat with them. So this is after he had walked on the water and they gave to that fear and the wind ceased immediately. It sank to rest as if exhausted by its own beating. And they were astonished exceedingly beyond measure for they failed to consider or understand the teaching and meaning of the miracle of the loaves. In fact, their hearts had grown callous, had become dull and had lost the power of understanding. And that has really stuck with me because that's what happened to them. That's why they didn't recognize that it was Jesus walking on that water. That's why they could go through the miracle of being 5,000 people being fed with, with nothing, absolutely hardly anything, but they didn't recognize. They were hearts were hard and callous. And that's been a place where Christian and I, I know, like he said, we've gone through a lot. And I, we have cried out to God. We have been on our faces, crying out to Jesus, crying out to God, because we've had a lot of battles. We've had a lot of situations, and we haven't always passed the test. Things would happen, and that fear would come after God would already have done something here, and then something else happened. So like he shared um, on the last radio program that we were with um, 
the listeners, we shared about our daughter, Sophia. She was diagnosed with epilepsy several years ago. At the same time, she was also diagnosed with a, a very large cyst in her brain. So we walked through the whole situation, what happened from start to finish with that. And she ended up having brain surgery in February. So we shared all about that. But the main thing that, you know, in that, when she first started having the seizures, a major spirit of fear came. I know specifically it came after me. It came after her. It came after our son who witnessed it. There was a lot of fear, especially when we would go to bed at night. And one night I was praying because I felt just fear. I couldn't sleep. And God spoke to me and he said to me, when your daughter was having these seizures in her room before we knew anything about it, she was by herself. He said, I was with her. I took care of her. I have her in the palm of my hand and she's going to be sure. okay. He didn't tell me she wasn't going to have a seizure. He said she was going to be okay. So that word anchored me. As soon as God spoke that to me, the fear left. And the rest of the time, really, there was a lot of peace. So fast forward, um, probably two weeks after we shared on the radio, she had not had a seizure in almost two years. They were getting ready to wean her off of her seizure medicine. You have to be seizure-free for 24 months before they'll start taking you off your medicine. So um, she was recovering from surgery, doing very well, um, and she went to sleep one night, and she had a seizure. So obviously, um, because she just had the brain surgery, we wanted to make sure there wasn't anything serious, like a bleed or was, anything. It, it was the worst seizure yes. episode that she'd ever that had. She had one, and then she had another one in the emergency room. In the emergency room. room. So we took her to the hospital, and um, she fell asleep again at the hospital, and she had another seizure, and it was major. It was horrible. It was horrible. Um, but at that moment, a demon of fear came after me so strong. And it came after my husband because it was ter- it was terrifying. I mean, to see your child go through something like that and it would not stop. Um, they had to give her medicine to make it stop. Um, they ended up sending her to Levine because of the, you know, obviously it, it had nothing to do with the surgery. There was nothing wrong. They really don't know what happened. It was probably more likely just recovery and trauma just from having that done and she was healing but it it was like that devil tried to come after us tenfold with that fear and um it even my son was having fear like at night he would cry he was afraid that his sister was gonna have a seizure I mean it was terrible you know at every point though God brought back the word of the Lord that had come to me when she first had seizures and we first you know, witnessed it. And he told me it's no, it's no different. What God said then was not, did not change because she had another seizure, but that devil was going to do everything he can to make sure that we, that fear was in our home. And it was a fight. I'll tell you, it was an absolute fight. I mean, we got on our faces before God. We prayed and we cried out. We prayed strong as a family every single night. You know, our pastors were aware, those in our, our lives, our friends, we, we shared with them what was going on. They would pray with us. We had prayer as a family at church because it was a demon. It was a demon, first of all, to attack her, to attack the call of God in her life. And it was a demon to bring fear for us to doubt what God had said. And a devil to question. Yes. You know, did God really say? Is God really true? Did God really Absolutely. tell you to go through with the surgery? You know, because that was a that was a big decision in our life, and we had to get we got before God, and we we got with our our pastors, ministers in our life, help us here. Do we need to do this? And we had peace. God said yes, and through it all, God said, "I will not relax." Gave us the scripture in the in the Bible, "I will not relax my hold on you or your daughter. I am here for you. Trust me." That's right, and it like I said, it it wasn't like immediately it left us. I mean, it was an absolute fight. And through it all, God started showing me a lot about, you know, how, how, how that devil brings that fear. And if you can, if that fear, if you give your will to that fear, it brings in a flood of just doubt. Um, and we knew that was the attack of the devil, but at every point, I mean, God was so faithful. We just kept praying. We kept persevering. And the more we did, the more that it left and it broke. Um, because there was probably about, I don't know, a month that I could hardly sleep. I mean, it was such a devil, like, is she going to have a seizure? I mean, it was totally the devil. But we did not let go of what God had spoken. And and at this point, you know, what, what God has so 
put in my heart. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if she has another seizure. It does not matter. God is God. God's going to take care of her. God has a hold of her and we're going to do the will of God and God is going to see her through because that's what he told us. So, you know, also in that, um, you know, a scripture that I read a lot is, is in Matthew. And I'm sure a lot of the listeners are aware of that scripture as well, but it says it's in Matthew 7. Because we had to ask, and we had to keep asking, and we had to keep coming to Jesus. We had to keep trusting in Him. Even though it wasn't an immediate response, or it wasn't an immediate breakthrough, we kept coming. And I read this scripture often, and I read it to my children, because we want to be perseverance. We want to be that person that is, is persistent. But it says in verse 7, Ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who keeps on asking receives, and he who keeps on seeking finds, and to him who keeps on knocking it will be open. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for a piece of bread, will instead give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will instead give him a snake? So if we, as evil as we are, know how to give good and advantageous gifts to our children, how much more will our Father, who is in heaven, give good and advantageous and perfect things to those who keep asking. And that is what I have persevered to keep in my heart and in my children's heart that we're going to see the breakthrough. It doesn't matter, like I said, it doesn't matter what the devil tries to bring. All it is is, a, is, is an attack to keep us and from hearing what God is saying to cause us to doubt to where we won't believe what Jesus is saying and to bring that spirit of fear. So it was a, it was a great, you know, I, I mean, I'm grateful for what we've walked through and we're still walking through. Um, I'm believing God for complete restoration in her life, and she has faith, and she's trusting God, and that devil of fear is not having our family. Amen. And uh, as we uh, this program comes to a close, I know time's getting short. Um, I had quite a few more scriptures that I would have liked to share, but I want to leave you with one in um, Hebrews um, chapter 4. This is in the New Testament, and um, it's in verse 12. It says, For the word of God, living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing and effective, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. It says, The word of God is living and active and full of power. And like I said at the beginning of the program, that word can be a revealed word to you directly from God. It can be the written word, a verse that God gives you in from the scriptures. It can be from your from a minister in your life, from a true friend. It can come in many different ways, many different ways. And I know all of us, all of the listeners, us included, we're all experiencing hardships in this day and age. You turn on the news and it, all you hear is depression. It's, it's depressing. There's no encouragement. And if you give yourself to what you hear and what you see and what you have to go through every day with prices are rising, things are up, it's a hardship. There are, there are struggles that we are all facing. And yes, a lot of those are financial. Some of you may have financial burdens and physical burdens and the financial increases that you're experiencing are making it difficult for you to take care of your physical body but through it all god is true god will give you a word one word he gave me one word 26 years ago out of the book of psalms i will live and not die and proclaim the mighty works of my god and i am walking in that word today and if, if you get anything from this program, be encouraged and know that God is true and God's word will carry you. It will lead you. It will guide you. It will direct you. It will encourage you. It, it's, it's been a great blessing and honor for us to walk through the things that we've walked through and, and get to know our God. And as we close this program, I know we referenced some of our previous programs and you can listen to those On our website, uh, wordoffaithfellowship.org, we are also here on on the air Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 8.30 to 9, and it's a great honor for us to be with you when when God gives us the opportunity, 
and we're so appreciative for everybody who tunes in and listens and um have a we just want you to have a blessed and encouraged day